The town of Scottsdale in northeastern Tasmania is a thriving service centre with a population of about 3,000 people. The town is set in the patchwork quilt of a fertile mixed farming district. About one hour's drive from Launceston, Scottsdale is on the main Tasman Highway a scenic route to Tasmania's east coast. From its beginnings at the junction of the Launceston and Bridport roads, Scottsdale has developed into a small but prosperous country town. This video was made to commemorate the centenary of the naming of Scottsdale, formerly known as Ellesmere. 1993 is also the year in which the municipalities of Ringaruma and Scottsdale are amalgamated into the new municipality of Dorset. The first settlement in Scott's new country was at Ellesmere in the 1860s. Today, this area is part of the township of Scottsdale. In the 1870s, the district looked like this. Small farms amidst the forest giants. Alexander Gill was one of the first settlers. He bought land at Westminster Road. This property was typical of those owned by the first pioneers who came from Scotland and England. In letters to his father in Scotland, Alexander Gill described the hard work of clearing the heavily forested land. The pioneers had to cut and burn magnificent trees 90 metres high and 3 metres in diameter. The whole Scottsdale district was often referred to as simply the forest. Mr Gill built a water-driven sawmill at Newtile. Tragically, he lost one of his grandsons in the mill's water wheel. With timber cut at his mill, Alexander Gill built some of Ellesmere's first public buildings. Ellesmere quickly became a small village with church, courthouse and the Ellesmere Hotel run by Alexander Gill. Today it's a residential part of Scottsdale. Sam Hawke's Ellesmere House is one of the few original buildings still standing at Ellesmere. It's now owned by local chemist Brian Evans and being well looked after. Visitors today see Ellesmere as an attractive part of Scottsdale with well-kept gardens and flourishing crops. The once vast forests have given way to a productive agricultural landscape. New tile, like other farms, produces good yields of potatoes. The old Gill family house at Newtile has been uninhabited for a number of years. The optimism of the first settlers has been well rewarded. In 1993, the countryside is a colourful mosaic of mixed farms. If they were alive today, the pioneers would be proud of the farms they once struggled to establish in the 1800s. Further down the road to Ringaruma, the pioneering Hazelwood family selected land. The remains of the forest giants that once covered Scottsdale can be seen on their property in the 1880s. 20 years after clearing began. Thomas Diprose Hazelwood built one of the first stores in George Street in Scottsdale. 
Many years later, this building became a YMCA hostel until it was pulled down in the 1970s. Today, the land is part of Anzac Park, a children's playground. This interesting document, dated 1865, is a request for a mail service from Bowood to Thomas Cox's house at Ellesmere. It's signed by many of the district's first pioneers. These included Thomas Cox, Mr. and Mrs. John Loon, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Beswick, Mr. and Mrs. J. Cunningham, Mr. and Mrs. James Jessop, and Mr. and Mrs. J. McCarrow. Four of the early pioneers photographed in 1919 are T.D. Hazelwood on the left, J. Cunningham, Dougal McGilp and James Campbell. Near the corners, as it was then called, Thomas Tucker built a store and post office. The Tucker family owned most of the land immediately south of King Street to Minston Road. Thomas Tucker built a water-operated flour mill on Tucker's Creek, near where Northeast Park is today. In the 1880s, this area was still heavily forested. The large building in the foreground is a brewery built by Edmund Button in the 1880s. Today, the site is occupied by the HEC. The Tucker family established extensive orchards on their property between Minston Road and Scottsdale. In other parts of the district, like Jetsonville, forest was cleared and productive farms established. The Eccleston family had orchards here and there was a Jetsonville store and school. All the orchards have gone now, but the old school is still used for community activities. Loon's Bush Dairy Farm at Kimona was typical of the small holdings in the early days. Miller's Dairy Farm at Springfield in 1911 was a much more ambitious undertaking. Here, the members of the Wish Wilson family stand proudly outside their newly constructed house at Springfield. The Beatty family on their farm at Springfield show how much progress has been made in clearing the land. Ray Wheatley's property at Springfield, as it was in 1890, then owned by the Waller family. At North Scottsdale, the pioneering Campbell family had established themselves in 1860. Here, the family and goods are being transported by Bullock, often necessary because of the muddy roads. There are still plenty of old timers who can clearly remember that life on a farm meant grueling physical work. Most tasks were carried out by hand, or at best with the aid of horses or bullock teams. Whole family and neighbours turned out at harvest time. Here's Mrs Lowe and her daughter working on their Springfield farm. Before the advent of tractors and other machines, the haystack was a familiar sight around Scottsdale. When the Murphy brothers brought steam-driven threshing plants to the northeast, it revolutionised farming. Contractors employed gangs of men who travelled from farm to farm harvesting and threshing crops. Hay was still being cut within the town boundaries of Scottsdale up to 50 years ago. Today this farm is covered by a former housing department area and the Scottsdale Primary School. The prosperity and character of the district is still essentially agricultural. Students at Scottsdale High School are often referred to as spud diggers by their city counterparts.
farming is more diverse and successful today than when the pioneers struggled against what seemed impossible difficulties. In the 1880s, Scottsdale as a town didn't exist. There were some shops and hotels near the intersection of the Mount Cameron and Bridport roads. George Street was the main thoroughfare. Regular coach services ran between Derby, Scottsdale and Bridport. Goods from the northeast were sent to Launceston by boat via Bridport. The road over the sidling was steep and almost impassable in winter. In the early 1880s, most of what is now Scottsdale was farmland owned by the Hazelwood and Tucker families. In 1885, a railway from Launceston to Scottsdale was started. It took four years to complete. The railway station was built well away from Ellesmere, nearer to King Street. It was opened in 1889. The railway brought new prosperity to the district. Transportation of goods was faster and more reliable. A passenger service meant that the old coach services would soon disappear. This shipment of reapers and binders was for Patmore's and Dinham's store. Now, in 1993, the passenger service has gone. The sale of Hazelwood's farm for town building blocks was prompted by the building of the railway. This expansion laid the foundations of the present township. Residents at the corners urged the government to change the town's name from Ellesmere to Scottsdale. This was in honour of James Scott, the surveyor who discovered the district in 1852. In March 1893, the town of Scottsdale was officially proclaimed. And by 1910, shops and houses had been built along the main roads. As we walk around Scottsdale in 1993, we'll see how much has changed in the last 100 years. The building of the Flinders Highway from Georgetown to Bridport has made George Street the main route for the transport of heavy goods, as it was before the railway came to Scottsdale. Kendall's Hotel Motel stands on the site of the old Scottsdale Hotel, which was built to cater for miners on their way to the gold and tin fields of the northeast. Across the road, the Vandenbosch's vegetable store was once A.W. Biggs's drapery and shoe store. Scottsdale Sports Store and Chris Lovegrove Supermarket stand at what was once the town's shopping centre in the 1880s. On the left is Rose's tailor's shop. The coaches carried passengers from the Scottsdale railway station up the coast to Derby. At what was called the Corners, a house stands on the spot where the original Lord's Hotel once stood. This imposing two-storey hotel was pulled down in the early 1900s when the present Lord's Hotel was built. Lord's Hotel still retains the grandeur of earlier times. It's changed very little on the outside. Originally named the Coronation Hotel, it replaced an earlier Inverness Hotel built in the 1880s. Moving up King Street to the present town shopping centre, we come to the Mechanics Institute, now used as a community hall. In the past, visiting experts gave talks and showed lantern slides here. It was also the town's library. 
Across the road is Scott Centre, used by the North East Community House Group and as an exhibition centre by the North East Arts and Crafts Association. It was the town's post office from 1890 until 1970. From this building in 1918, the warden announced the end of World War I to an excited crowd. Rose's News Agency, a modern, efficient business run by David and Joe Ezzy, has strong links with Scottsdale's past. The Rose family took over this news agency and tobacconist shop in 1906. Next door to Rose's news agency is Hookway's shoe shop. In the early 1900s, this was A.W. Loon's business. Mr. Loon was a prominent member of parliament and historian. Remarkably, in spite of many different owners and new buildings, these shops still sell the same kind of goods today. Across the road, Muscle Seafood Shop is part of a complex owned by Vicky and Brian Evans. The exterior has been carefully preserved and refurbished, retaining the Federation character of the building when it was the Commercial Bank of Australia. This part of King Street has changed substantially. It's occupied by Pool's Shop, the ANZ Bank, Skin Fitness Centre and the new Westpac Bank. It once had a baker's shop, residence and Mr. Davis's barber's shop. The bullocks have been replaced by log trucks. The Uniting Church is another building largely unchanged. Recently repainted, it retains much of its original charm as a country church. It was built in 1901 after an earlier church on the site was destroyed by fire. Next door is a block of shops, some owned by the church. Kilworth and Gregory's saddlery shop was here in the early days. The Scottsdale Council's plan to put all cables and wires underground has improved the appearance of King Street. Even 70 years ago, telephone wires were starting to clutter up the street. Gilston's furniture store, run by the Johnston family, remains largely untouched on the outside. It used to have veranda posts and was a general store and grocery shop. The Ranson family built this block of shops in the early 1970s. It houses the Gemini coffee shop, Tiffany's hairdressing salon and Barrett's drapery. Thomas Saunders and later the North East family originally had a store at this location before it was burnt down in the 1970s. From the opposite side of the street we can see the Lyric Theatre, now used as a liquor outlet. The theatre was once a popular entertainment venue where talkies were shown in the 1920s. On the same site as the Lyric Theatre, the unusually shaped advertiser office there are three different forms of transport in the picture. Cart, motorcycle and stagecoach. Across from the Lyric Theatre is 7SD and Richardson's Furniture Store. Originally on the corner was Williams General Store, T&G Williams Photographic Studio and Burton's Cabinet and Upholstery Shop. Looking towards Scottsdale, Rolf Boss Supermarket is on the left, while on the right is Scottsdale's new library. Eighty years ago, Scottsdale was a very quiet country town. On the left was a general store, owned at various times by Cams, Hookways and Marshalls. We now move into Victoria Street, recently beautified by the council, with the assistance of Mr. Jerry Holder. It will eventually have trees once again as it did in the 1920s.
Eleanor Street was named after Thomas Hazelwood's daughter. Many of the houses were built in the early 1900s. The view of Charles Street from the showground shows just how fast Scottsdale was growing in 1910. The Scottsdale Council has contributed much to the growth and development of the municipality over a period of 86 years. I'm talking to Peter Partridge, warden of the Scottsdale municipality. Peter, what do you think of the assets of this municipality? To begin with, nature was extremely kind to this municipality and uh, provided a number of uh, very valuable natural assets, uh, namely the native forests for uh, sawmill and timber and uh, wood fibre, uh, fertile soils, a moderate climate, a good average rainfall which ensures adequate water supplies all year round, spectacular scenery uh, both inland and along our uh, natural coastline and uh, certainly a good clean environment. Agriculture provides a wide range of products. Potatoes, onions, peas, beans, carrots, poppies and hops are some of the main crops, with the Edgeal Bird's Eye Vegetable Processing Factory being a major employer. Dairy, beef cattle, wool and fat lamb production are other prominent agricultural activities. The native forests continue to provide hardwood timber and pulpwood chips, whilst the Forestry Commission radiator pine plantations are a source of logs for the French pine and os pine softwood operations. Both these modern milling complexes provide significant employment, as does the Forestry Commission itself. Fishing is based at Bridport, where the recently built Allen Barnett Fish Factory is the focal point. Trout farming is also an important industry to Bridport. The AWPM clay mine and the pyrethrum extraction plant, both located in the Tongana area, add to the diversity of interests. The municipality boasts an excellent health care system based on the NESM hospital. The state education system provides schooling for students from kindergarten through to year 10 the school farm and the outdoor education being features of the, of the high school. The Scottsdale Recreation Ground is a feature in itself, providing facilities for a wide range of activities. It is the home of the Mighty Magpies Aussie Rules Club and also the venue for the annual Scottsdale Agricultural Show. Peter, what do you see as the future of the new Dorset municipality? I believe that the new Dorset municipality has a very bright future. The two municipalities being joined together contain people of similar interests. We've always had common ground amongst us. The North Eastern Soldiers Memorial Hospital has always been the base of health services for the whole North East and brought the people together. Unfortunately, the mining industry has uh, seen some drift of population from the pioneer Gladstone and South Mount Cameron areas. But on the plus side, the Winley Irrigation Scheme has given a lift to the agricultural aspect of the area and in particular the uh, essential oil industry is one that's expanding. There are a number of major industries in that area. The uh, UMT Milk Factory at Ledgerwood is very important to that district. Another industry that I believe could flourish in the North East is that of tourism. I think with proper development and with promotion, the township of Derby in itself could become a major tourist attraction. So I believe, all in all, that the uh, Dorset municipality has a very bright future. To conclude our look at Scottsdale municipality, past and present, we'll take you now to some of the district's special places and then you can see for yourself why we are so proud of this part of Tasmania.
We've got a winner. You've got to cut another one now, Sally. Uh, Susie. Thank you. 